Unit 2, Segment 5, Solar and Wind, Renewable Energy. Okay, so solar energy is primarily used for heating and it can also produce electricity, generate electricity. There are four types of solar systems. Passive solar heating is one. Passive, totally passive, there's no pumps, there's nothing, um, there's no electricity that's required. It's basically using the sun's energy to convert to heat. So think of a greenhouse. That is a passive solar heating system. Think of your car parked in the parking lot with the windows rolled up on a sunny day. How hot it is when you get in. That is a passive solar system. So you have sunlight coming through the windows, um, being converted into heat inside your car or inside a greenhouse. Um, and that is passive. Think of third floor of the Portage Northern High School. You're on third floor and you're facing the south. So that would be facing the um, middle school. And you got the sun coming through those windows. It is warm. It really makes those, those classrooms very warm. It's a passive solar system. So it's nice in the winter. Um, but you have to make sure that you do design the building a little bit better to make sure that it's not so awful in the summer. So there are a few criteria that you're going to need to know for the test. You're going to need to know how does a passive solar heating house take advantage of this system. You want south facing windows because in our, at la our latitude that's where you find the sun is in the south side of the sky. So that will get the best sun. If you look at this diagram right here you have the sun over here you got summer sun high up in the sky and you've got winter sun so a long overhang on the outside of your house by your windows actually prevents the summer sun from coming in because that's not really when you want the, the heat in the summer you don't really want that heat but in the winter the sun's at a low enough angle that that um, it goes right underneath the overhang and you can still benefit from getting that sun coming in you want to use blinds at night to keep the heat in and open them up during the day in the winter to get more energy coming in and then you want to close them and keep the heat in at night. You also want to make sure that your insulation for the home is very thick so it keeps the heat in. That's a passive solar system. There's no electricity, there's nothing, it's just engineering your house to take full advantage of that sun coming through the window being converted to heat. Now active is a little different. You now have um, pumps going on. So you're taking advantage of the south sun, the south facing part of your house, but you are putting in a flat plate solar collector. It's a tank. If I can get my cursor working. These are not solar panels. These are actually tanks. They're hollow on the inside and they're usually black in color and you have water or air that flows into them, the sun hits that, that black color and large surface area absorbs that sunlight and converts it into heat, heating the fluid inside, so air or water. And that comes into the house, goes into the water heater, where your water heater doesn't really have to work as hard because it's already warm, and then it distributes to your shower or your faucet or your washer or wherever it is that you want warm water. Um, so it sends cold water up that absorbs that energy and then it comes back and is pumped through the rest of your house. So this does require a pump. It does require a little bit of electricity to run that pump. I have to tell you about Mrs. Hertel. Mrs. Hertel has a pool and right next to her pool she has her garage. And her garage, um, the roof um, is facing the sun. So what she does in the springtime her pool water is very cold, obviously, so she will stick a pump inside her pool and connect black tubing and run and zigzag it up her to the her garage roof and zigzag it across, zigzag it across the roof. This black tubing, think of it like a hose sitting out in your lawn. It absorbs that sunlight energy and that water, and the hose is warm. The same thing is happening with her pool water as she pumps it through these tubes and it goes right back into the pool. It's brilliant and she's using an active solar system. Um, she's taking advantage of an active solar system by doing that. 
Super, super cool, super awesome. So, no, so far we've learned passive and active solar systems. Photovoltaic cells, go ahead and say it, photovoltaic, it's a mouthful. These are your solar cells that you've seen, solar panels that you know and love. They, they are actually converting solar energy directly into electricity. So you have a chemical reaction that takes place. The cells contain two plates. And you can see there's um, sunlight coming in. It hits this anti-reflective coating, so it's, a, it's more of an absorber, absorber rather than a reflector. And anyhow, it, it chemically reacts between the two plates and creates a charge, a flow of charge. And this diagram kind of shows you a little bit more how that works. You have electrons moving. You have a negative and a positive contact situation. You have um, when the sun hits it, it creates this reaction and the electrons flow. Flowing electrons is voltage, so friends, we have current. Um, let's see, you want south-facing, like, orientation for your solar panels, and these are actually panel, panels, not the tanks that I showed you in the earlier slide. These are full-on panels. You can have them on your roof, or you can have them on your yard, on a, on a plate or whatever, but you want them to face the south so they take full advantage of the most sun it can possibly get. The technology is advancing with solar panels. They're now sensitive enough to even work in cloudy days, and Michigan, I do not remember what the study showed, but there was so many days of the year that have clouds, and I'll tell you, it's way more than 50% of our days here in Michigan are cloudy. But we are advancing in our technology. We're getting the solar panels are sensitive enough to continue to work in, on cloudy days and work effectively. But um, this is a really great alternative. The only problem is that it's a little expensive to start up. This is not something you might have heard of. I'm not sure. It's called a concentrating solar power, CSP. We know that sun has energy, right? And if we can concentrate that energy in one spot, we can probably deliver a lot of heat energy to that spot. So you can see in this picture, this is a great picture that shows this, illustrates this out west in the desert. You have these mirrors, and that's what these are, are mirrors. And they reflect, they're all focused to concentrate the energy right here at the top. And anyhow, there's fluid. It's, it's some kind of fluid material. It could be a gas or it could be liquid. But it's going to create steam, and the steam can then turn a turbine. If you want warm water, for example, just flat out warm water, not electricity, it can do that too. You can see a close up. Um, this is another type that it's kind of like a, a bended mirror. So it's concentrating the, the light energy to this pipe right here and this pipe has fluid running through it. It could be a liquid or it could be a gas, but it's going to pick up that energy. It concentrates it and picks it up and transports it to wherever we want to go. So it's really a concentrating energy kind of setup. Um, the, the advantages to using solar is there is no fuel, okay? Um, with the active, you do have to run the pumps, so there's a little bit of uh, electricity required for that, but for the most part, there's no fuel to use the solar. There's no greenhouse gas air um, emissions or, or other air pollutants with this renewable source. It requires very little maintenance. Um, we can use them as small and small scale, like homeowners can actually purchase some, so it's not just large scale power plants. It can lessen your electric bill, which is kind of nice. And with new technology, newer innovations, it can open up job opportunities in the future. The drawbacks are that manufacturing the devices, like the solar panels, for example, does create air pollution. We are limited to how effective they are to sunny locations, and they're expensive still. So up front, there is a big expense, but once the infrastructure is in place, it's ship shape, ready to go, very little maintenance. I'd like to try to squeeze wind in here as well. So with wind, remember how you just need to turn that turbine? If we could just turn the turbine, wind has energy. It has kinetic energy. So it's able to do that, turn that turbine like the hand generator showed you in the class. And the turbine is connected to the generator. Well, this is a gearbox, but it's connected to a generator. The gearbox is nice because small movements, if it's geared down, then it will 
generate more electricity, even small movements. So when you go and you look at a windmill moving, it's barely moving, it's still going to be functional. Um, also remember that wind, though, can be traced back to the three main sources of energy, really traced back to the solar um, energy of the three main energies for our planet Earth. Windmill farms are what you see in this upper picture. There's, there can be hundreds of windmills there, and they generate a lot of electricity. Offshore wind turbines can be implemented, like, for example, in Lake Michigan, where it can pick up these major um, wind patterns. And uh, studies show that wind speeds are about 20% greater over water than land. I guess because it's mostly flat. The pros to using wind is very it's non-polluting at all. There's no fuels that are used. It's very efficient, meaning that there's not very many energy conversions that take place along the way to lose heat. So we can use them small scale. We can have some set up at people's homes, or we can go large scale with farms. And it's less expensive maintenance than the fossil fuel power plants. It does it does require maintenance, and KVCC has a great program to train technicians to help build and maintain those. So if you're into that and you like heights, that's the job to go for. Um, drawbacks to using the wind power, the startup costs are high, just like solar and, and hydroelectric. But once they're set up, they're cheap. You are limited to very windy areas. The wind can be unpredictable at times, so generally you want to go higher. The higher up you get, the more predictable the wind patterns are. Um, some people feel that it does clutter the landscape. It is something that's going to be in your field of view, so um, that might not be something that is appealing. Personally, I think they are amazing looking. I think they are super awesome. If you're close to one, you might hear some noise. Um, some of the gears, you know, need constant fluid lubrication so it can get noisy. I was talking to an MSU um, researcher and he was talking about birds and bats being impacted. Not just the migration patterns or the birds and the bats running into them but they actually create a low pressure right behind the blade and so it can actually explode the air pockets in their, their sinus cavities. So anyhow, um, you have to be mindful of migration routes when, you, when installing these windmill farms. And that is it. That's where we're going to stop, friends. So there's only one more segment of this unit.